Welcome to the Door Roller Money Podcast. My name is Rob Berger, and today in episode 206, we're going to talk about retirement accounts and whether you can use them as a source uh, for a down payment on a home, what the rules are, and of course, whether it's a good idea, the pros and cons. And then I'm going to introduce uh, kind of a new segment on the show. I call it the Daily Dough. I call it that because, I don't know, I kind of like the name. But it's going to be a time where just for a few minutes, I'm going to share... Uh, something that's been going on in my life, something I've read, maybe a new resource I found on the internet, uh, you know, it could be a news item. And today to kick off, you know, sort of the the, the first uh, daily dough, we're going to talk about suffering. I know, what fun. And then we're going to round out the show with uh, an email from a listener named Cedric who wanted to know whether uh, real estate investing is a good way to save for uh, retirement. And so what I thought I would do is actually share with you, for better or worse, the numbers related to my real estate investing. It's tax time, and I have all the numbers in a spreadsheet uh, that I gave to my accountant. And I thought, well, why not just uh, be be transparent today, and uh, I'll show you all of the numbers, for, again, for better or worse, with my real estate investing. So that's the plan today. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and to begin with, again, uh, retirement accounts and buying a home. And so what we're going to do, I want to first break it down with, can you do it? And what are the consequences of doing it? Then we'll get to the question of whether it's a particularly good idea. And so uh, to get that started, one thing that I want to make clear is that you can always withdraw money from a 401k or an IRA, right? I mean, no one's stopping you from taking money out of your retirement account. Uh, The real question is, what are the consequences? Are there negative consequences uh, for doing so? And when most people ask the question, can I use a 401k or an IRA as a down payment for a home? What they're really asking is, will I get hit with that pesky 10% uh, tax, that 10% penalty, as it's called, uh, for taking money out out of the account? And uh, the answer is, it depends. Depends on how you do it. And and the truth is, you can access money in both a 401k and an IRA, and for that matter, both a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA, for a down payment on a home without getting hit by the 10% penalty. But the rules are different for all three types of accounts. And uh, so let's walk through it. Let's start with a 401k. Now, uh, I start here because, you know, you may have heard of this first-time homebuyer exception uh, that you can take advantage of to avoid the 10% penalty. Here's the thing. That exception doesn't apply to a 401k. It only applies to an IRA, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 401k doesn't have that kind of an exception. So then the question is, well, then how in the world do you use a 401k for a down payment on a home? The answer is you get a loan. You can borrow from your 401k. Again, let's put aside for the moment whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Let's just talk about whether you can do it and how you can do it. Most 401k plans allow you to borrow from your 401k Uh, retirement account. Uh, The amount you can borrow is limited, however. It's limited to uh, one half of the balance in your 401k, but not to exceed $50,000. So the absolute most you can borrow is 50 grand. uh, But again, it's also limited by uh, how much you have in the 401k. So it's one half of your balance or 50,000, whichever is less. That's the, the limit. Now, of course, you don't have to borrow uh, that that much, but that's the most that you can borrow. And when you do borrow, uh, generally you pay it back through uh, withholdings from your paycheck over a five year period, uh, and you pay interest. And you'll have to check with your your four hundred one k provider as to what that interest rate will be. And you may be saying, "Well, wait a minute, I pay interest. Who exactly do I pay interest to?" Well, you pay it to yourself. The interest payment goes right back into your four hundred one k. So that's one of the, as you might imagine, one of the advantages to a 401k loan. You're not paying the interest to a bank or to a credit card company or some other lender. You're paying the interest to yourself uh, through your, your, your monthly payments on the loan back into the 401k. Now, you might be thinking this sounds pretty good. Uh, let's talk about some of the, the thing downsides, if you will. Uh, one, if you leave your job, for, it doesn't matter why, you get fired, the, the company goes out of business, you just decide to change jobs, you can be forced to pay back any outstanding balance uh, in full. Now, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you fail to repay the loan, whether it's because you've left your job and you just don't repay the balance, or maybe you stay at your job, but for whatever reason, you just stop making payments uh, to the 401k loan, what happens? Well, the IRS is going to deem any outstanding balances, and they're going to convert it from a loan 
to a distribution. It's like you just withdrew the money. And of course, we know what happens then. One, you get hit with, with income tax on, on that amount. And assuming you're not 59 and a half or older or have some other exception to the 10% penalty, uh, you're going to get smacked with that 10% penalty. And so uh, that's kind of at a, at a high level how the 401k works. Uh, and, but it is an option. You could take a 401k loan uh, as a, a down payment uh, on a home. And that would be your option if you wanted to tap a 401k. So what about an IRA? Well, an IRA has a specific first-time home buyer exception to the 10% penalty rule. So first-time home buyers can uh, withdraw. And this is not a loan. Remember, we had a loan for the 401k. This is just taking the money out. Uh, first-time home buyers can take up to $10,000 out of their IRA and uh, if they qualify, and not, they won't be subject to the 10% penalty. Now, you might say, okay, well, how, how do you qualify? Well, you have to be a first-time home buyer. You have to be buying a home that you'll live in, so your primary residence, and you have to be a first-time home buyer. Now, leave it to a bunch of lawyers and politicians to, to define first-time home buyer. I would think, you know, it would be, hey, this is the first home I've ever bought. Eh, that ain't right. Well, a first-time home buyer is anyone who has, has not owned a home as their primary residence in the last two years. So if you owned a home five years ago and uh, it was your primary residence, you sold it, and you've, say, rented for the last several years, as long as you haven't owned a home as a primary residence in the last two years, you are deemed to be a first-time home buyer. Go figure, right? And if you qualify for that, then you can qualify for this exception. Now, one really important thing to keep in mind, while this exception uh, keeps you from paying that 10% penalty, you still have to pay taxes. You know, we're talking about a, a, a traditional IRA where you've taken a tax deduction for the contributions when you made them. Now you're going to take up to 10000 out uh, for a home. You have to pay taxes, and it's going to get hit you. Not only is it ordinary income tax, but you know this in, this is going to be treated as income. It's going to be above and beyond what, uh, what um, all the other taxable income you have for the year. And so the result is you're going to get you're going to pay taxes on it at your marginal tax rate, so you're really going to get walloped with taxes, and uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is for those that are married, if you each have IRAs, you can both do this. So uh, a couple could take out up to twenty thousand uh, dollars if they met the first time home buyer exception rule, not pay the ten percent penalty. You would have to pay the taxes, but then you'd have whatever's left over for uh, a down payment on a home. That's the IRA. Now, uh, before we get to whether this is a good or bad idea, let's talk about the Roth IRA. Roth IRAs are always different um, and no exception here. So a couple of things here. One, as you probably know, contributions you make to a Roth IRA, you can always take out at any time for any reason, right? Remember, you've with a Roth IRA, you're contributing uh, money that you've already paid taxes on. So you've already paid the piper, so to speak. And uh, so the IRS says, yeah, you can take it out. You've already paid us, so you can take it out whenever you want. And it doesn't matter. We don't care why. So certainly if you have contributions to a Roth IRA, you could take those out to buy a home. Now, it gets a little trickier when you're dealing with the earnings on those contributions. So let's say your total contributions add up to whatever, $20,000. And um, they've been in the Roth for a number of years, and you have $15,000 in earnings. So you could take out the $20,000, that's contributions. Now, what about this earnings piece of it, the $15,000 in earnings? Well, it turns out that if you qualify for the first-time homebuyer exception that we talked about with the traditional IRA, you can take up to $10,000 in earnings, not only not pay the penalty, but also not pay taxes on it, but they have to have been there. You have to open the account for at least five years. Now, it gets complicated, and this is not something I've ever done. So I did some research, and I found a resource uh, on, the, on Charles Schwab's website. So I'm going to literally read to you what their website says, because this is tricky. You ready? With a, here we go. Quote, with a Roth, withdrawals of contributions are always tax-free because you've already paid income taxes on that money. So are withdrawals of earnings of up to $10,000 under the home buyer exception, assuming you've had the Roth for five plus years. But if you withdraw more than $10,000 in earnings, that money will be subject to both ordinary income taxes and the 10% penalty, end quote. Well, there you go, right from Charles Schwab, clear as mud, right? Uh, it kind of makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes uh, sense to you. But 
if you have any questions, you know, as I've said many times, I'm not a tax expert. So you want to talk to the folks that hold your Roth IRA or seek advice from your accountant or a tax professional because it does get complicated and you don't want to foul this up. So those are the sort of the high level basic rules for tapping a 401k, an IRA or a Roth IRA to buy a home. That leaves open the question, is this a very good idea? Now, I suppose I could just say, nope, and end the show. Don't ever do it. Have a nice day. Thank you for listening. I'm not sure that's really the best answer because in a perfect world, I think that's the right answer. In the perfect world, you'd leave your retirement money alone and, uh, and uh, you know, you'd let it grow. And you'd ma- you know, in a perfect world, you'd have, we'd, you know, we'd have no debt. You'd max out your retirement accounts every year. Um, and the Ohio State Buckeyes uh, football team would win the national championship. But that obviously, unfortunately, I'm very sad to say, doesn't happen. And the reality is, I can imagine some situations where uh, actually tapping one of these sources could be not such a bad idea. Um, So let me tell you what I mean. So the first thing is, if you're just tapping a retirement account to buy a home, you're going to get a a 3.5% down FHA or I think Bank of America now has a 3% loan, and you haven't been able to save up a 3% down payment, so you're going to tap your retirement account. I really think that's not a great idea. I mean, I, you know, again, it might be easy for me to sit behind the microphone in my home that I now have, right? And I know I'm, you know, maybe in a different situation than other folks, and it might be easy to say, don't do it. But I really think it's a bad idea. It, you know, I think uh, um, having the discipline and the consistency to save up even a, a relatively small down payment, 3%, 3.5%, maybe 5%, is important. And I think that that really should happen before you take on the pretty significant financial commitment of buying a home. That's my view. But now let's imagine a different situation. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've not only saved 5%, you've saved 10 or 15%. And your thinking now is, man, if I, if I could just tap some sources to get that down payment up to 20%, I could avoid private mortgage insurance. Well, now maybe we're not talking about, you know, that may be a little more reasonable. Of course, there are other ways to do that, right? You can get a home equity line of credit as part of the closing, uh, which is actually what we did on our home, and uh, get to hit that 20% that way without tapping a retirement account. But still, I could see it, you know, maybe a little more reasonable. If that's you, or if you say, yeah, Rob, I appreciate your opinion, but I don't really care. I'm tapping my retirement account anyway, um, then I would suggest uh, kind of thinking through which account would you, would you actually use. Now, for some of you, you may, you may only have one. You may only have a 401k or an IRA. Uh, some of you, though, might have two of those accounts or all, all three, including a Roth. So how should you go about thinking, you know, which one should you, should you use? Here's my view. The absolute worst one is the traditional IRA. And it's kind of ironic because that's the one you know that we think of in terms of this first time home buyer exception is the traditional IRA. You know, why would that be the worst? Well, I think it's the the worst of, of the three options for two reasons. The first is, as I mentioned, you get hit with ordinary income tax and it's going to be at, at your marginal rate because this is going to be income over and above what you and perhaps your spouse you know, earn and will already be taxed on. And so you're going to get hit at that marginal rate. And uh, that's a lot of money. So that's, that's the first thing I don't like about it. The second thing I don't like about it is you can't put it back, right? It's gone from your, your retirement account. You can certainly continue to contribute in, to an IRA going forward. Uh, but this money that you take out, you can't a few years later, maybe when you've, you, you've saved some more money, say, hey, I, wanna, I took 10 grand out you know, three years ago. I'm going to up my, my contributions this year and add that 10,000 back into the IRA. You can't do that. It's gone. It's, it's out of your retirement savings forever. And particularly for, for younger folks who are, t- you know, are typically taking advantage of first-time homebuyer type programs, you know, you're giving up decades of compounding on that money. And um, that's a killer. That's a lot of money. So to me, the traditional IRA is the worst of the three. Uh, Coming in second place would be the Roth. Why? Well, like the uh, traditional IRA, when the money goes out, you can't get it back. So that's the big, big negative. But at least you're not getting walloped in taxes, right? Uh, The the contributions, you've already paid taxes on, so they'd come out uh, without tax consequences. And if you follow the rules, as I read read to you from Charles Schwab and, and making sure that those are still correct because these things change all the time. Uh, you might even be able to take some of the earnings out uh, without taxes. So a Roth IRA potentially eliminates at least one of the big negatives with a traditional IRA. 
Again, doesn't eliminate the the pretty significant downside of having this money removed from your retirement accounts forever. Uh, so so that but that's why I, I kind of view the Roth IRA as the number two option. To me, the best option, and I got to be honest with you, it, this kind of surprised me as I kind of did the analysis for this podcast in an article, and I also wrote an article for Forbes on this. But to me, probably the best option in most situations with some caveats that I'll talk about is a 401k. Why? Well, one, it's a loan, so you're not paying any taxes on it, right? That's number one. Two, you put it back. At least if things go according to plan, you put it back. Uh, and so it continues, once it goes back into your account, it continues to work for you for your retirement. Uh, the interest you pay uh, doesn't go, get paid to a bank. It's paid back into your 401k account. Uh, so, so that's a, another positive. And, so, and, and, and you can borrow more. I mean, you know, you're not limited to $10,000 like you are with an IRA. You could, in theory... Uh, borrow uh, m- more money. Now, the caveat, the big caveat is you really need to think through what happens if I change jobs? What happens if I lose my job? Will I be able to repay this money somehow, find some resources to pay back the loan so that it's not deemed a distribution uh, and I get hit with the taxes and the penalties? And of course, only you can assess that, but you absolutely have to think of that worst case scenario before you ever take a 401k loan for any reason, whether it's to buy a home or any other reason. And, uh, but if you're comfortable, uh, you know, and again, you're probably going to assess the likelihood that you will leave your job, but even there, it's, it's, it's it, at best a guess, who knows what life's going to throw our way. You're going to assess that. You're going to assess your ability to pay back the loan if that should happen. Really, really important. Uh, otherwise, what turned out to be not such a bad idea could really become a really horrible idea, which, which by the way, is one reason a lot of folks will just say, don't ever get a 401k loan. And I get that. I mean, in an ideal world, you, we wouldn't ever get a 401k loan. But if it's something you're really seriously thinking about, that's what you have to take into account. So there you go. In a nutshell, my view on, on both you know, whether you can and how you go about using retirement accounts as a down payment on a home the pros and cons, whether you should, which accounts, in my view, would be better or, or, or not so good if, if that's what you wanted to do. And uh, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, dr.doorroller.net, or better yet, join the Facebook group, doorroller.net slash Facebook group. And I uh, would love to have you. And it's growing every week and would love to have you join and ask questions and, and, and leave links to resources and cause a ruckus. I don't know. There you go. All right. So, now we're on to the daily dough. So recently I've been reading a book called When Breath Becomes Air. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's by, it's by Paul Kala. I'm going to mess this up. I even practiced this before the podcast. Paul Kala Nithi, I think. <laughs> K-A-L-A-N-I-T-H-I. It's a fabulous book, even if I can't pronounce his name. Uh, so this is a spoiler alert. My guess is if, you, if you've heard of it all about this book, you, you, you know the, the, the backstory. But if you don't and you don't want to hear it, well, spoiler alert. Uh, so Paul uh, was a brain surgeon. And he learned, I think he was 36 or 37, basically ending his residence, uh, residency. Uh, and um, he learned that he had lung cancer. He was not a smoker, uh, but he learned that he had lung cancer. And that he was going to die um, is, the, is the brutal reality. He didn't know when. Uh, it could be several years. Wasn't sure. He was married at the time. No children. His wife's name is Lucy. And, he, and while he was basically dying, he wrote this book. And it's uh, a, a beautiful book. And I highly recommend it. And uh, one of the great things about it is it's got nothing to do with money. huh? Uh, but I want to read you something in the book. And then I'm going to talk about it in terms of finance and investing, oddly enough. Uh, So here goes, uh, just a couple of paragraphs. Uh, And this uh, starts out, this is his wife talking. She said, what are, and this is to him, again, at this point in their lives, they don't know when he's going to pass away. At this point, he's relatively healthy, uh, but obviously very serious condition. And she says, what are you most afraid or sad about? She asked me one night as we were lying in bed. Leaving you, I told her. I knew a child would bring joy to the whole family, and I couldn't bear to picture Lucy husbandless and childless after I died. But I was adamant that the decision ultimately be hers. She would likely have to raise the child on her own, after all, and to care for both of us as my illness progressed. 
Will having a newborn distract from the time we have together, she asked. Don't you think saying goodbye to a child would make your death more painful? Wouldn't it be great if it did, I said. Lucy and I both felt that life wasn't about avoiding suffering. It's just an amazing passage. And the words that struck me, wouldn't it be great if it did? And I'm thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Amongst all the pain and suffering they're going through, they want to make choices that might increase his death, the pain, the pain that his death might cause. And as I thought about that, it was really quite beautiful, right? Because the more difficult the death is, the more beautiful the life was, right? And uh, they ultimately decided to have a child, and they did. And the child, I believe, was eight months old uh, when Paul, Paul passed away. And I thought about this passage and his life in this book, and I thought, you know, so often uh, we want to avoid the difficult things. We want to avoid hardship. We want to avoid suffering. And I guess at one level, uh, that's natural, for sure. Uh, but sometimes leaning in, right, not moving away from the difficult things, uh, can actually make life beautiful and all the more enjoyable. It certainly did for Paul and his wife during you know difficult times that frankly, for me and perhaps for many of you, uh, are unimaginable. Uh, I mean, I suppose life is what it is and we all go through some level of suffering that can't be avoided. Uh, but certainly what Paul and his wife went through was extremely, extremely difficult. And, you know, at least as he describes in his book and on this issue, they didn't, they didn't turn away uh, from, from the the pain and the suffering. And they, they did the best they could uh, with the difficult circumstances that they were under. And it seems, you know, as I think about decisions that we make every day, whether it's about money or family, relationships, work, uh, whatever, uh, what's our natural tendency? Do we turn into the difficulties? Uh, Do we lean into them? And work through them, or do we try to avoid them? I even think about it as a, a parent, you know. And when it comes to money, when my you know son or daughter you know is strapped for money, uh, and maybe because of choices they've made, do I sort of jump in and try to save them, or honestly, do I let them suffer a little bit? It's not easy to let your children suffer, even even something that that pales in comparison to what Paul and and his wife went through, uh, or do you know do you just tend to jump in and, and save them? And then, as, as a result, rob them of what is a critical learning experience uh, in their lives. And uh, so that's kind of where I am with our children. And uh, uh, they each have different issues when it comes to money and different strengths and weaknesses. But so you know, all too often, I want to kind of save them from their own decisions. And, you know, frankly, sometimes it's just easier to do that, right, than to have to deal with the consequences of allowing them to feel the, the you know, the, the pain of decisions uh, that they've made. I even think about that, oddly enough, in the context of, you know, what we just uh, uh, discussed, retirement accounts and buying a home. Are we just taking the easy way out? Uh, you know, it's hard to save money. It's hard to cut back and save a big down payment on a house. It'll be easy just to tap my 401k. Do we take the easy uh, route? And I think many times, uh, the easy route, uh, you know, is just not the great option, and we rob ourselves of becoming better, uh, or of our friends and family, if the circumstances involve them, becoming better or, or, or stronger. And uh, so, there you go. That's my thought of the day, my the daily dough, but the first one, suffering, and that could maybe I'll try to come up with something a little more upbeat uh, <laughs> uh, for next time. Uh, but uh, there you have it. I think sometimes suffering, as painful as it is, can be the best thing for us. Um, we hope we don't suffer in some ways, I guess, in life, though, uh, you, sometimes you just can't help it. And by the way, if you haven't read When Breath Becomes Air, highly recommend it. It's just a remarkable book. And Paul was a phenomenal writer, very good writer. Um, and uh, again, highly, highly recommend it. All right, now moving on to maybe something a little more upbeat, uh, or, or not, I guess, depends on your perspective, my, my real estate investing. So again, a listener named Cedric had emailed me and asked me, you know, hey, is real estate investing a good, um, a good way to save for retirement? And um, so I thought, you know, rather than, you know, pontificating about the pros and cons of real estate investing, 
I would just share with you my numbers. Uh, I will say that, yeah, I think real estate investing is a perfectly fine way uh, to invest, whether it's for retirement or just, you know, to invest. Uh, it has certainly has a lot of tax advantages, but it has some other issues that buying stocks and mutual funds don't have. There's liability concerns, uh, you know, there's management of the properties and, the, you know, that can be an issue even if you hire someone. Uh, to help you manage them. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's more like a business, really, than just a passive investment. And uh, so, but with that sort of background, let me kind of give you a high-level view of the real estate that, 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 that my business partner, he's also my best friend, he and I own, and then I'll share with you some numbers. So here's the deal. Uh, 11 years ago, 2005, we started investing in real estate. Uh, in Colum- in the Columbus, Ohio area, his father is a realtor and a real estate investor. Term- you know, decades of experience. My friend had invested in some properties. Both had flipped some properties, and in- and in- and invested in properties that he he continued to own and and rents out. And so he had a lot of experience. We certainly used the the and benefited from the experience that his father has. And uh, we put three bids on uh, uh, on three homes, HUD foreclosures in 2005, and I was absolutely terrified. Uh, I was terrified that we would, you know, even to buy one uh, uh, property, you know, the, the rehab would 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 be would go terribly, um, you know, we couldn't find a renter. I mean, all these bad things in my mind. But he assured me, don't worry, we're not going to even win one of these homes, let alone three of them. Well, as fate would have it, we won we won two of the properties. Uh, HUD is sort of an auction, online auction style. Uh, bidding process. We won two properties, 2005. So here I am from no real estate uh, investments to two two single family homes, one of which needed a substantial amount of work, completely gutted the kitchen, bathroom, uh, the, the backyard was a mess, had an above ground pool that had to be torn out. Uh, the fence was falling apart. A ton of work. The second home, not nearly as much at all, really, just some cosmetic uh, things, but um, uh, that's how we got started, and we 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 invested um, ten thousand dollars each. We got portfolio loans, which are loans from local banks that don't get sold to folks like Freddie and Fannie, and therefore the bank has a little more leeway on um, the terms. And so we would get five year adjustable mortgages, and they would agree to to let us borrow. Eighty percent of the improved value of the home, which if we were working hard and doing things correctly, would end up being almost one hundred percent of the investment, meaning uh, the cost to buy it from HUD and the and the cost to repair it, uh, typically amounted to just about eighty percent of the of the uh, the value of the property, the appraised value after the of the property after the rehab was over. So yeah, we each put ten thousand in, and we would use that for some things, but. We found that we could almost get a home with no cash at all. There was always a few thousand here or there to pay, and uh, and that's what the ten thousand uh, each was for. Plus, just to have some money in the, in the account to deal with uh, the unexpected repairs and whatnot. We ended up, uh, I think, each putting in another five thousand. So the total investment was about fifteen thousand. And uh, uh, after those two homes, we bought three more from two thousand and five through two thousand and eight. I want to say, and then we ended up selling one. Actually, one of the, the first one we bought that uh, needed the complete kitchen rehab and the above ground pool taken out, we ended up selling that to one of the tenants. And so uh, that uh, basically, if we fast forward to today, we've each gotten our fifteen thousand dollar investment back. Uh, we have a checking account that's got about twenty five thousand dollars in it. I told you I'm going to be transparent, so I'm giving you all the numbers. So we've each gotten our fifteen thousand back. We've got a checking account with about twenty five thousand dollars into in it, which is is accumulated over the years from paying, you know, from the rents being paid, and then we obviously pay the mortgage out of it and everything uh, and everything else. Um, and then on top of that, we've probably taken out another, I'll say five thousand dollars each. Uh, and then we own four of the five properties. We've only sold one of them, so we still own four of them. They're all roughly one hundred thousand dollar properties. I would say the least expensive property is, would sell for ninety to one hundred. Probably the most expensive property would sell for maybe one sixty five. Is my guess. Uh, and again, these are in Central Ohio, and uh, you know that's pretty typical for a, a, sort of an average home, single family home in a, in a good school district in in Central uh, in Central Ohio. So, what do the numbers look like? Well. As I was looking through all four properties, the the total rents for the year uh, varied from about eleven thousand up to seventeen thousand. And again, the eleven thousand in rents is for the property that's worth about ninety. The seventeen thousand dollars in gross rents is for the property that's worth about one sixty five. 
And uh, that kind of uh, um, is consistent with a rule of thumb that we use, and it's this. We want to be able to get re- a monthly rent equal to at least 1% of our investment in the house. So if we buy a home for 80000 put $20,000 into it, that's one hundred grand. Uh, we want to be able to get at least $1,000 a month in rent for that property. Otherwise, it's probably not a great deal for us. That's the rule of thumb that we use. And we've met that. In some cases, we've, we've crushed it. That last property, that the, the least expensive property, we were probably getting close to 1.4%, maybe even 1.5% at one point. And uh, we found that if you can do that, you're going to probably cash flow uh, pretty nicely, even if you finance a, a big chunk uh, of the purchase. So now, of course, we have expenses on all the properties, insurance, maintenance, mortgage interest, uh, property tax, and then, and then repairs. Um, and, and, and that doesn't even include capital expenditures, right? So for example, this past year, we spent almost $5,000 on a new roof for one of the properties. Uh, but when you back out all of the expenses, excluding the capital expenditure for a moment, what I'm finding, what we're finding is we're generating about $7,000 per property per year in positive cash flow. Uh, Now, that doesn't include depreciation. Of course, depreciation is a non-cash expense. That's great for us because it it means that that $7,000 in cash flow is basically uh, I'll call it tax-free. Maybe tax-deferred is the better way to think of it. But we're able to deduct the depreciation, and so for me, it basically means I don't pay any taxes on any of this cash flow uh, right now. In fact, I usually can carry over some tax losses from from year to year. Uh, but but again, basically about seven thousand uh, dollars a year per property, roughly a little more for some, a little less uh, for the others. And uh, so that's you know seven fourteen twenty one twenty eight thousand. And um, uh, that goes into the bank. Uh, obviously, we have to ha- we do have to pay for capital expenditures from time to time. As I mentioned, the roof this year for about five thousand dollars, and that's kind of where we are after eleven years of investing. Uh, not a ton of money, I don't think, uh, that we had to contribute, but a lot of work, uh, you know. And uh, obviously, we, we manage the properties ourselves. If you were going to pay someone, I would say the going rate is typically eight to ten percent of of the gross rent to have a, a, a management company manage it for you. You can still make real estate investing work that way. Many people do, but it's not insignificant. And, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, in our case, uh, that would have put a big dent in our cash flow. Uh, right now, four properties, it's not too difficult uh, to manage it. And so that's, that's what we do. So is this, uh, you know, how does this fit into the overall retirement plan? Uh, I mean, it's, it's great. You know, income. I think if I were going to be serious about real estate investing, I would have I would have bought a lot more properties by now. We, as I said, we haven't bought one since two thousand and eight. Uh, but you know, when we pay out a distribution to, to to each other, I take the money and I I invest it. I put it into Vanguard. No surprises there, and it goes c- continues to to work for us. Actually, what we're going to start doing now is maybe paying down some of the mortgages. The interest rates are relatively low. Uh, but savings account rates are even lower. And unless we're going to buy new properties, which at the moment we're not, uh, it seems like the best use of the, of the money. And, and by the way, the reason we're not is just because of time. He's got it. My, my friend's got a job. I'm, I'm busy here in Virginia. And there's just a, a limit to how much time we have. And real estate investing takes a lot of time. Frankly, it takes a, a lot of time just to find the right properties and then make the bids. And then you lose the bid. And then you start all over looking for more properties. And you make the bids and you lose the bid. And then you you know, you know do it over and over again. Eventually, you get a property. And then the real work begins. So um, you know, I'm not a late night infomercial here where I'm going to tell you that with no money down, you too can be a real estate millionaire in no time because that's just ridiculous. Basically, my view is real estate investing works like this. It is, the, it is the work your butt off and get rich slowly plan. And I think those are the best kind. And uh, if you do that, you, uh, you, know, you, you can certainly, I think, save a lot for retirement. And it, again, they've got great tax advantages. You can sell a property, take the proceeds, and through what's called a 1031 exchange, invest it into a new property and avoid paying the taxes for now. Uh, on, on the gain, which is a, a great benefit. You, depending on your income, you can deduct up to twenty-five thousand dollars in losses. And remember, with real estate, you can have a tax loss because of the depreciation, even if your properties are cash flowing. So, again, the tax benefits to real estate investing are very good. The one recommendation I would make: if you're totally new to this, you're not sure where to begin. 
is find a realtor who is also a real estate investor. Don't don't talk to a realtor realtor who doesn't you know own properties and hasn't flipped properties. That's not who you want. You want to find a, a, a real estate agent who is an investor as well. And that's who you want to learn from, and that's who you want to help you. Uh, it, that will make a huge, huge difference. Well, there you go. There's insight into my real estate investing empire, my four little properties in central Ohio, for better or worse. By the way, I should add, I have to fill, I have to file an Ohio state tax return, right? And if you own property in multiple states, you got to file, assuming that they have income tax, you're going to have to file... Uh, a tax return uh, in every state. So that does add some complexity, I guess, something I should mention if you're thinking about investing out of state. But again, I'm very happy with the investments. I do think my friend and I will probably, uh, hopefully, I think, buy more down the road. Just don't know exactly when. But if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, dr.doroller.net. Or again, better yet, join that Facebook group, doroller.net slash Facebook. Well, there you go. Hope you have a great day. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.